Luther wanted assurance of salvation. Calvin desired to acknowledge the sovereignty of God. The radicals were committed to kingdom principles. The King of England wanted a divorce. On the face of it, Henry VIII's motivation seems less than salutary, especially when compared to church renewal on the continent. The English monarch may have instituted profound religious change in the English realm, but it was men like Thomas Cranmer, Nicholas Ridley, and Hugh Latimer who saw the ideas through to a semblance of maturity. The way was not smooth. Henry died before he could complete the transition. King Edward inclined to Protestantism, but was manipulated by his advisors and died prematurely at 16. Mary reversed these trends and returned to Rome, and for good measure, sent Cranmer, Ridley, and Latimer to Oxford, where they were burned alive. It was left to Elizabeth I to straighten matters out, which she did rather admirably, and Latimer's hope of a candle strong enough to survive the storms of time did emerge. This seesaw battle of church history is the powerful story of the English Reformation. The English Reformation is really a misleading term. The British Isles, as we might refer to it today, was comprised of four areas then as it is now. England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. The Reformation in each of those four areas constitute four, not one, four separate stories. The British Isles is not a geographical, political or cultural unity. It wasn't then any more than it is now. But for the sake of time and uh, doability, as it were, I'm going to focus on the Reformation in England. But I begin with that caveat that there were four separate Reformations in the British Isles. Before getting into the Reformation in England, I want to spend a few minutes talking about historiography and using the English Reformation as an example. Uh, historiographically, the term means the writing of history. There's at least six approaches, six different schools of thought on the subject of the English Reformation. And I want to say something about each of the six. It'll give you an idea of how historians go about the task of handling history and doing the business of investigating and writing about a subject. The first school is represented by the late A.G. Dickens. Now, Dickens approaches the English Reformation by looking more at the popular influences and the dissemination of the Reformation on that level, common people. In his uh, interpretive framework, the Reformation in England was a good thing. It had purpose, it had direction, indeed, a certain sense of inevitability. The Marian martyrs, of whom I will be speaking of in due course, are Dickens's heroes. And one of his books that I would refer to as representative is called The English Reformation, 1964. A second school of thought, uh, Geoffrey Elton, the Cambridge scholar. He sees Thomas Cromwell, whom we'll be introduced to, not Henry VIII, Thomas Cromwell, as the author of the new order. And don't confuse Thomas Cromwell with Oliver Cromwell, who is 100 years off and was a Puritan. Elton <clears throat> concentrates on issues at the top rather than the bottom of society, like uh, Dickens did. And his book, uh, the relevant one, is called Reform and Reformation, England 1509 to 1558, and that was published in 1977. A third school of thought represented by Patrick Collinson, takes into account Puritanism and says we really have to deal with them in order to understand the English Reformation. And he corrects the notion of Anglicanism as a via media, a middle way between Catholicism and the general Reformation. He concludes the people really didn't want the Reformation in England at all. And his relevant book is The Religion of Protestants, 1982. Fourth school of thought, 
uh, represented by Jack Scarisbrick. He says people were content with religion the way it was before Henry and his colleagues decided to change things. Reformation in, in Scarisbrick's interpretation was an act of state. It was nothing more than that. Simple act of state. The Reformation then was regrettable, undesirable, and indeed undesired. The laity, he argues, were disadvantaged by the Reformation. They didn't come to the fore. They simply sat silently in their pews, harangued by the all-powerful preachers in England. In his book, The Reformation and the English People, 1984. Fifth, the Catholic Cambridge scholar Eamon Duffy. He sees the Reformation in a sense similarly as does Collinson and Scarisbrick as something that was forced, lacking popular support, at least early on. He says it was negative, Reformation in England up until at least 1570, and thereafter you can begin to see Protestantism a bit more positively. His uh, very powerful and influential book <clears throat> was called The Stripping of the Altars, Traditional Religion in England, 1400 to 1580, and that appeared in 1992. The last school of thought that I mention in dealing with the English Reformation is Christopher Haig, and he's a revisionist. He agrees with some of the comments I've already made. It was a state-induced reluctant obedience on the part of English people, and that really is what constitutes the English Reformation. And it's not a single Reformation in England, but a set, a series of Reformations. And Reformation was a process in Haig's thought with no coherence, no sense of direction. It was, in fact, a catastrophe. And his book called English Reformations of 1993. Now that's just a little dip into historiography. We all bring biases and prejudices to the historical topic. I have my own and so do you. We have to be aware of our biases and try to be as objective about them as we can. So let's jump now into the context of this reformation, whether good or bad, popular or hierarchical in England. I start with A.G. Dickens and quote, Although the English church, during the period 1500 to 1530, stood poorly equipped to weather the storms of the New Age, altogether it was poorly equipped to weather the storms, it was, this Church of England, a grandiose but unseaworthy hulk. He's going to use the analogy of a ship. Its timbers were rotted and barnacled, its superstructure riddled by the fire of its enemies, its crew, grudging, divided, and in some cases, mutinous. Its watchmen were nearsighted and far from weather-wise. Its officers lacking in navigational skill. If in this situation the king decided to take personal command of the said ship, most Englishmen, indeed even most churchmen, would be likely to applaud rather than object and few would stop to consider that the kings of England bore not a little responsibility for the problems of the church. You see where Dickens is coming from? We've got a corrupt institution that is badly in need of fixing up. And the person who says, let's fix it, is the king. Well, this was one view, certainly, but it wasn't the only view. Now, Henry VIII is the monarch in question who takes an interest in matters of ecclesiastical reformation. And Henry wrote against Martin Luther, and for his efforts was awarded by the Pope, Leo X, with the title Defender of the Faith. It is a title English monarchs carry right up to the present. You take a piece of uh, British sterling coin uh, and look on, I think it's the back side, you'll see the initials FD. It's the same thing in Latin as it is in English, uh, Defensor Fidei, Defender of the Faith. That was given to Henry and Elizabeth I, that's, or Elizabeth II. Currently, that's still one of her titles, Defender of the Faith, though I 
suspect that the faith being defended has changed just a little bit over those centuries. Now, Reformation in England, though occurring roughly simultaneously with the continental reforms in Saxony that we've looked at with Luther, in Geneva with Calvin, in Zurich with Zwingli and elsewhere, did not, I argue, did not gain its momentum, did not originate from theological concerns as the others did. The primary forerunners were not the Lollards, the followers of John Wycliffe, but rather they were loyalists. Loyalists. Luther was concerned with ecclesiastical abuses. The English Reformation was preoccupied with the presence of alien domination, that is to say, Rome. Henry VIII promoted Caesaropapism. That's a big word, you break it down, it's Caesar and Pope put together, and the order of the words is significant. Caesaropapism, the king has power over the church, over the religious authorities. That Caesaropapism, clearly evident in the reign of Henry VIII, would be continued in his predecessors Edward VI and Mary Tudor, and we'll be looking at both of those monarchs. William Warham, the Archbishop of Canterbury, was ineffective in trying to preserve papal authority in the face of Henry's initiatives. This supreme authority of a secular ruler over the church was not, of course, without its antecedents. I refer to Constantine the Great in the fourth century, and I refer to the donation of Constantine, which we have looked at in subsequent lectures. But there were instances where the opposite was true. Think back with me <clears throat> to 1077 at Canossa, here at the castle of Matilda in Tuscany, where the German king, Henry IV, was forced to stand barefoot in the snow before the might of Pope Gregory VII. Or Innocent III, that great 13th century pope, called the most powerful man on the face of the earth. <clears throat> now, it may be suggested that the Reformation in England occurred as a result of one of three things. Number one, an act of governmental coercion. And as the story unfolds tonight, you'll be able, in conjunction with your own reading and research, to make perhaps your own judgment on which of these three uh, issues prompted Reformation in England, an act of governmental coercion, secondly, really as a result of spiritual and institutional upheaval, or thirdly, that it came about because of religious apathy, but one of those three possibilities. But now, we must speak of the two important men in the first years of the English Reformation. One was named Henry, and the other was named Thomas. Be that as it may, what caused the Reformation, be that as it may, one cannot avoid the drama surrounding the king's great matter. And what was the king's great matter? Well, it was simply this. King Henry VIII wanted to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon. Marriage to Catherine <clears throat> had been arranged, admittedly. She was the widow of Henry's deceased brother, Arthur. They were only married for six months when Arthur unfortunately died. The marriage was political of Aragon, Catherine of Aragon. There were Spanish connections and the houses of England and Spain were closely allied. But when things went badly with Spain, Henry no longer wished to retain Catherine as his queen. John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, defended her. That will cost Fisher. I assure you. Henry argued that his marriage ought to be annulled on the grounds that it had been wrong in the beginning. Citing the Levitical law of the Old Testament wherein taking one's brother's wife was forbidden. And Henry said, oh my goodness, I have sinned before God. I have married my brother's wife. I have violated the covenant of the Old Testament. What shall I do to find forgiveness? I must, alas, put her away. 
Mind you, he was deeply in love with another woman at the time he came to this revelation of the Levitical law. Hopelessly in love was he with Anne Boleyn. But Anne was shrewd and she refused to go to bed with Henry unless the king married her and legitimated her. Well, the papal court, enmeshed in affairs with Charles V, did nothing, at least for a while. The matter was referred then to the universities of Europe, particularly to the theological faculties, and this at the suggestion of the other important man at this time, Thomas Cranmer. Well, the bulk of opinion that was offered up by the European universities was that the marriage was legal and that Henry should in no wise put Catherine away. Well, Henry was not happy with that opinion. Anne made him happy. Now we've got a dilemma on our hands. So what happens? Henry established the Church of England and set up his own Cicero papal control and with the fall of the papal legate, Cardinal Wolsey, who bore the brunt of Henry's wrath for failing to secure papal permission in the first place to have the marriage annulled, a power vacuum was formed in England with Henry determined to fill the void with his own liking. So, in December 1530, Henry charged the English clergy with Praemunare. Praemunare, the Latin term, it was established in 1353 and it forbade, statutorily forbade, appeal to Rome in church matters when settlement could be reached in England. Now the statute is 200 years old, but where there's a will, there's a way. And Henry charged every man jack of a priest in England with violating the statute of Praemunare, and he fined all of them exorbitantly. And what did they say? They said absolutely nothing. They shut up, paid up, and did what the king wanted. Further obedience then to Rome, in principle or financial, was forbidden with legislation in 1532. And in February 1533, restraint of appeals placed supreme ecclesiastical jurisdiction in the king's hands. In November 1534, the title Supremum Caput Ecclesiae was applied to Henry, Supreme Head of the Church. We recognize his majesty as the supreme protector, the only and supreme Lord in so far as the law of Christ permits, even the supreme head. Now both houses, convocation and parliament in England, ratified the title that the King of England was the only supreme head, and I'm using parliamentary language here, the only supreme head in earth of the Church of England. The Pope ipso facto has been replaced by the king legally. This isn't just a rogue king. You've got parliament, you've got convocation who have ratified this. This becomes known as the Act of Supremacy. And it means just what it says, the Act of Supremacy. By November 1534, a treason act was passed. And the treason act made one guilty of high treason to consider the king a schismatic, or by implication to deny that the king had supremacy. Well, there were two notable casualties to this treason act, because they questioned the king's supremacy in church matters and they questioned the jurisdiction of the Act of Supremacy. And those two notable casualties were Thomas More and the aforementioned John Fisher. Both of them were, in fact, executed as a result. Well, by the end of that year, papal authority in England was essentially abolished by law. It's out, it's finished. By 1536, the authority of the Bishop of Rome, I speak now of the Pope, 
was declared completely invalid in England. Now theologically, the English Reformation was fairly conservative. There was continued adherence to the doctrine of transubstantiation. Eutroquism was deemed to be unnecessary, the giving of the wine to lay people in communion. Clerical celibacy was continued. Private masses were continually observed. Auricular confession, that is going to confession and speaking your confession to a priest and hearing the absolution, was continued. Nonetheless, Rome had been overthrown in England, as this woodcut shows, flanked by Thomas Cromwell and Thomas Cranmer. Henry VIII has usurped Pope Clement and John Fisher, and poor old Cardinal Pole, of whom we will hear of later, along with a bunch of monks, vainly try to intercede, but alas. Well, Bible reading in English, rather than Latin, was a significant step. As early as 1533, Henry declared there should be a Bible in every church in the realm. And then Henry arranged for the disillusion of the monasteries. And we see places like Fountains Abbey, the Cistercian House in ruins because of Henry, uh, Barry St. Edmunds, a Benedictine house in East Anglia, and the Benedictine Whitby Abbey on the northeast coast. The abbeys, the monasteries, the convents were dissolved and the wealth went to Henry. I mean, there's no point in having monasteries churning out monks and nuns when you don't want the Pope to be in control in the country. It all makes sense. Once the ball starts rolling, you've got to enact legislation. All of this amounted then to what Eamon Duffy called, revealed in the title of his book, The Stripping of the altars. But now, too much can be said about uh, Henry VIII, and we must shift our perspective now to Thomas Cranmer and the town, the university town of Cambridge. The influence of continental reform theology came to England via Cambridge. It was propagated through a most unlikely medium, the White Horse Pub, a tavern a public house. That's where the Reformation got its start in England. Okay, the White Horse in Cambridge was the scene of regular meetings, we are told, in back rooms, uh, behind the, the closed doors, under the cover of night, if you will, meetings that were convened for the express purpose of discussing the books of Martin Luther, which were illegal in England, but they'd been smuggled in, and what better place to discuss theology than in a most unlikely place, like a tavern. So while people are drinking and eating and having a good old time out front, there's some fellows in the back room who are talking about Luther and the reform of the church. I'd like to point out that many of the first generation English reformers were in Cambridge at one time or another. William Tyndale was there, Barnes, Thomas Bilney, Hugh Latimer, Miles Coverdale, Thomas Cranmer, Frith, Lambert, Ridley, Parker, the list goes on. They were all in Cambridge at that time. Now whether they were actually in the White Horse I can't prove, uh, but it seems likely that at least some of them were. And would you believe that the White Horse became so famous as a result of these meetings that it got the nickname Little Germany because they were reading the German theology of Martin Luther. How remarkable. Now there were no Martin Luthers, there were no John Calvins in England, but there was in fact Thomas Cranmer who becomes the Archbishop of Canterbury. Cranmer was in some ways a pawn, if you will, on Henry's large chessboard. But if the English Reformation came together at all, it did so, I would argue, initially in the person of Thomas Cranmer. If by his life he saved her from the power of Zorich, then by his death he saved her from the power of Rome. Which was more important? For Tertullian, 1400 years earlier, the blood of the martyr 
is the seed of the church. But according to an Arabic proverb, the ink of the scholar is worth more than the blood of the martyr. Perhaps for Cranmer both of these adages are paradoxically true. Thomas Cranmer, born in 1489 and died in 1556, he went up to Jesus College, Cambridge, and you go up when you go to Cambridge, and you go up when you go to Oxford and anywhere else you just go to it, and when you're done you come down. These universities are not on hills, but you go up. He went up to Jesus College, Cambridge, and he came into contact with Luther's thought while he was there. Was he in the White Horse? I don't know. But he was in Cambridge when those meetings were going on. But we don't have evidence he was there. Erasmus was in Cambridge at the time. But again, there's no uh, evidence that the two men actually met. Now, while Cranmer was indeed involved in academic pursuits, he was fonder of a young girl, uh, a relation of the landlady of the Dolphin Inn, another pub, rather than studying his Greek. He'd rather go off and see this girl who was called Black Joan of the Dolphin. I'm not sure why she was called Black Joan, but notwithstanding, he married her. Thomas marries Black Joan, and he was kicked out of Jesus College because fellows of Jesus College were not permitted to be married. Alas, within a year of marriage, Black Joan died in childbirth. And the fellows of Jesus said, we're happy to take you back now. So he went back to Jesus because he no longer had a woman in tow. In 1529, Thomas Cranmer became involved momentously and historically in the king's great matter. It was Cranmer, as I suggested earlier, who mentioned to the king, let's submit this case to the theology faculties of the European universities for their judgment, and let's see what the universities and what the professors and what the theologians have to tell us. He got married again, Thomas did, to the niece of Andreas Osiander, the Lutheran reformer at Nuremberg. And then in 1533, he will step onto the stage of history, as it were, when Cranmer was elevated at the behest of Henry to the See of Canterbury as Archbishop. It was Thomas Cranmer who nullified Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon. Now this freed Henry up to marry Anne Boleyn, with whom he'd been in love for some time anyway. But Henry soon wearied of Anne, and she was charged with sexual impropriety and was dispatched post-haste to the Tower of London, where she was summarily beheaded. Of course, Henry would go through six wives before he was all said and done as he reformed the church. Some say Cranmer sided with Henry in order to save his own skin. He knew full well that Anne was innocent of the charges, but to go against Great Harry would be, in fact, suicide. Recall the fates of John Fisher and Thomas More eminent men, a bishop in the case of Fisher, chancellor of the exchequer, trusted member of the inner circle of Henry's uh, uh, group and colleagues was Thomas More, yet they lost their heads. In 1536, the Ten Articles were published in England. This was a summary of the theology of the reconstituted church. The bishop's book then replaced the Ten Articles the next year, and Cranmer obtained license for the use of English Bibles in parish churches. During this time, Matthew's Bible uh, came into being, as well as the so-called Great Bible. Cranmer was accused in 1543 of heresy, of Lutheran heresy, and there was evidence. Cambridge, the White Horse, Luther's influence there, he had opposed Henry mildly over the uh, bishop's book. Hugh Latimer, who we will hear of more later, had been condemned for heresy in 1532, and Cranmer stepped up to defend him. Aha! Uh -huh. But happily, Henry sided with his archbishop, and the crisis was passed. Cranmer opposed simony. 
In 1544 to 47, in that period, he reformed the liturgy. In 1544, the English litany and the services were converted into the vernacular, the common language. And in 1547, the first book of homilies appeared at the behest of Cranmer. The winter of 1547 saw the end of Henry's reign after 38 years. Reform, I have to say, under Henry had failed. On the night of January 27, 1547, as the king lay dying at Whitehall, the English church was divided. Cranmer was at Croydon and had to ride hard over the winter roads to arrive at Whitehall at one o'clock in the morning to be by the side of the dying monarch. As always, Cranmer rendered his final, in this case, final faithful service to Henry as he had done for over 14 years. And thus, with a final press of the hand, the crown of England passed from the head of this tempestuous old man to a mild young boy, the ripe old age of nine. There's an apocryphal story that as Thomas came in to see Henry on his deathbed, Henry said, uh, perform the sacrament of extreme unction, final rites. No, Thomas shook his head. Henry said, why not? And Cranmer said, because you have abolished it. Well, it is an apocryphal story because we know that Henry could not speak. He had a stroke, hence the press of the hand. Now, this picture of 1548 executed to commemorate Cranmer's order for the destruction of religious images, through the window at the top right, men can be seen carrying out the destruction of those images. H uh, Henry is dying there in the bed to the left. At the foot of the throne where you see little Edward sitting, the idolatrous and the superstitious Pope has collapsed before the true word of God pronounced by the supreme head of the Church of England. His council, that's Edward's council, looks on piously as Henry hands on succession. Standing is Somerset, sitting next to him are Northumberland, Cranmer, and Bedford. Now when Henry died, there was no comprehensive statement of doctrine existing for the English church. Church structure of England had remained essentially unchanged, except for the very top. Pope is out, king is in, and Cranmer's the archbishop. But worship and piety and religious practice remained essentially unchanged as it had been for generations. I would argue that Henry VIII died Catholic, just not Roman, but he was certainly Catholic in his heart. Now, Reformation under Edward VI. Now, Edward wasn't a little baby, as you see here, but I show you this portrait of him as a little baby because, in a sense, how can a nine-year-old run a country as bellicose as England? During the six-year Edwardine reign, the whole of England groaned, as it were, and was astonished to find itself Protestant. Edward was in favor of the Reformation, but it was Cranmer and other advisors who had his ear. You see, the power was not in the throne, it was in the guise behind the throne. The real power lay with the Lord Protector, the Duke of Somerset, Edward Seymour, and the Duke of Northumberland. They, with Thomas Cranmer, caused official religion in England to become Protestant. The key influences were men like John Knox, ultimately, Thomas Cranmer, Martin Bootser, Peter Martyr, John Hooper, Jan Lasky, the Pole, and Nicholas Ridley, among others. In Erastian fashion, and by Erastianism I mean Caesaropapism, the king, the secular ruler, has more authority in the church than the pope, bishops were appointed by the government. The chantries were dissolved. The Latin mass was simply abolished. The acts of uniformity were passed down through the parliamentary process regulating parish worship. Clerical marriage was legalized. 
Of course, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, is twice married. But the priests now are free to marry in England. The first book of common prayer, still used in the Anglican communion around the world to this day in subsequent revisions, was produced by Thomas Cranmer in 1549. It was received by the reformed group. Uh, Calvin and the Zwinglians had no problem with it, though Philip Melanchthon, Luther's successor, rejected it. Second edition of the revised Book of Common Prayer came out in 1552, and Martin Bootser, along with his uh, famous wife Vilbrandis, has now moved to Cambridge. Uh, Bootser was part of the revision, uh, along with Peter Martyr, and they made contributions to Cranmer's cause. Traditional bishops in the Church of England were now replaced by churchmen who were more eager for radical ecclesiastical reform. Well, the reform had begun in plunder, the stripping of the altars, the destruction of the religious houses, the dissolution of the monasteries under Henry. Why even church bells weren't safe? 32,000 pounds of bell metal went on sale at Grimsby, while Sir William Cecil held another 15,000 pounds personally. And he's been melting the bells down and selling the metal. Well, all of this added up to the fact that the house was swept and garnished, purged of its Roman furniture and trimmings. At the height of this effort, at the height of this stripping of the altars, to use Duffy's phrase, Edward VI, at the age of 16, up and died. 6 of July, 1553, leaving the future of the Protestant faith in England very much in doubt. While Edward was dying, for he did not die all at once, the Duke of Northumberland connived to have his daughter-in-law, Lady Jane Grey, made queen. She was 16 years of age as well. Now the legitimate heir to the throne was not Jane Grey, it was instead Edward's oldest sister, Mary Tudor, Henry's daughter, daughter of Catherine of Aragon, the only surviving child of Henry and Catherine. <clears throat> Cranmer was induced by Edward on the latter's deathbed to support Lady Jane Grey. Mary, of course, claimed her rightful uh, succession to the throne. Jane Grey's reign lasted a total of nine days, and she was executed. The Duke of Northumberland was executed on charges of treason. Cranmer could see the handwriting on the wall. He sent his wife and family to the safety of continental Europe, but refused to flee himself. As Archbishop of Canterbury, he regarded his solemn duty, regardless of cost or consequence, to stay in England, to stay at the helm of Reformation. Predictably, he was arrested on charges of high treason and sent to the tower where the fate of dissenters was often rather severe. A variety of disasters, including war, bad harvests, disease, and the premature death of Edward meant that the Reformation was stillborn. Upon the death of Lady Jane Grey, the aforementioned Mary comes to the throne, and it is now time to rebuild the altars. If Henry and Edward have stripped the altars, Mary says, it's my duty to rebuild them. And Mary was a staunchly pious and faithful adherent of the Roman Church. She reenacted the statute. The Latin is literally translated concerning the combustion of heretics de heretico combruendo, the burning of heretics. She reenacted it from 1401, which gave the ecclesiastical courts power to deal quite harshly with heresy. This was the beginning of the so-called Marian persecutions, and it is where this queen gets her nickname, known to this day, Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary is going to rebuild the altars, and if I've got to kill every Protestant to do it, well, I jolly well would, because it's good to be the queen. Even Protestant London was shocked 
when Nicholas Ridley boldly declared in the pulpit that Mary was a bastard child and as such was not a true heir to the throne. Well, this guy's either got uh, a lot of intestinal fortitude or he's lacking in some wisdom to say such a thing from a public pulpit. Together with Cardinal Reginald Pole, Mary returned England to a Catholic state. All prior legislation from the reigns of Henry her father and Edward her brother were overturned, with two exceptions. One, royal supremacy remained. No point in going all the way back to Rome. I rather like having final say in the church, said Mary. And secondly, there would be no question about restoring ecclesiastical assets. <laughs> no, uh, Dad did a good thing when he dissolved those monasteries, and the coffers are still quite full, and uh, we're going to keep the Pope out, and we're not going to give back the ecclesiastical assets, but other than that, we're going to get back to the straight and narrow, said Mary. Meanwhile, poor old Thomas Cranmer found himself in the tower with uh, Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer. I hurry the story up. In October 1555, at Oxford, Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer, found guilty of heresy and other offenses, were taken to the stake. I want to share with you one moment that transpired. The two men tied to the stake, the fire is lit, and Nicholas Ridley begins to shake and quiver, as many of us might, about to be burned alive. And Hugh Latimer, it is reported, turned to him and spoke some very memorable words when he said this, Be strong and play the man, Master Ridley, for we shall this day, by God's grace, light such a candle in England as I trust will never be put out. And they died for their faith. Thomas Cranmer could see their execution from his prison window in Oxford, and he came to trial shortly thereafter. He denied the charge that he'd allegedly said to Henry, give me the Archbishopric of Canterbury and I will give you license to live in adultery. He said, I did not say that. I did not enter into some sort of conspiracy whereby the king and I could mutually benefit. Cranmer said, I protest instead before you all, there was never a man come more unwillingly to a bishopric than I. I didn't want the job, but how do you say no to great Harry? 68 years of age was Cranmer, and he folded up under the pressure, under the long imprisonment, under the threat of a cruel death, he recanted. It's easy to stand in judgment of men and women who recant who stand down in their faith. It's easy to do it sitting in the comfort of your living room when there is no persecution, when there is no religious intolerance to adversely affect you. Cranmer recanted. He decried Luther. He swore off Zwingli. He confessed the Church of Rome. He accepted the Pope as the Vicar of Christ. He embraced the doctrine of transubstantiation that when a priest says hocus corpus meum, bread becomes flesh. He accepted the doctrine of purgatory and he enlarged his number of sacraments from two to seven. Then, having done that humiliating action, he wrote to Mary, begging clemency. She washed her hands of him. She would have nothing to do with Cranmer after all. You might have recanted, old boy, but it was you who put my mother away. Some 25 years earlier. No, she was going to have her pound of flesh, and so to the church of St. Mary's in Oxford, Cranmer was taken, where he was forced to listen to the customary public sermon about cutting out the diseased branch for the sake of the vine. And then he was called upon to make a public affirmation of his recantation. And he got up on the platform, and everybody Pause to listen now as the Archbishop of Canterbury affirms that he's recanted, and guess what he did? He recanted his recantation. He said, I've changed my mind. 
I did it under pressure, I did it under fear, I recant my recantation, and then, in the moment of shock before anyone can do anything, he ran. Yes, 68-year-old Thomas Cranmer ran from the church, and no, he was not trying to get away. I have retraced the steps from St. Mary, his likely run route, and he ran to the middle of Broad Street, which today runs past Balliol College, one of the Oxford colleges. He ran to the stake. And as they lit the fire around Cranmer, John Fox, the martyrologist, records that Thomas Cranmer held his hand into the flames and said, because this is the member which sinned in signing the recantation, it shall suffer first. And it is said that he died with his hand outstretched in the flames. Well, there is some truth to the statement about the reformers that Cambridge educated them and Oxford burned them. I've done some math. No fewer than 25 Cambridge University men, reformers, were burned in Oxford, including the aforementioned Cranmer, Ridley, and Latimer. And those three men died right here on this spot, on what today is Broad Street in Oxford, uh, mem remembered by that plaque on the middle of the street, the cross. And they are memorialized by this plaque on the wall outside Balliol College. Well, at the height of all of this, 800 Protestants fled abroad. There were notable martyrdoms in England. The three I've mentioned, John Hooper, executed in the doorway of his church in Gloucester. Martin Bootser, he was dead, but that did not save him from the wrath of Bloody Mary. She had him dug up in Cambridge, and what remained of him was burned on Market Hill in Cambridge, just as John Wycliffe had been 130 or so years earlier. Well, the Marian persecutions had made Catholicism, dare I say, somewhat unpopular, for it was rather un-English to go around killing people. I mean, not very civilized at all, even if you disagree with them. And she accomplished very little in the North, did our Bloody Mary. The gentry did not restore the religious houses, and they persisted in holding on to the monastic lands that they'd taken. Well, the Marian policy of religion could not easily be altered. Drastic measures were necessary. What are we going to do? It seemed like only political revolution or the death of the queen could accomplish the desired result. Political revolution seemed somewhat unlikely. Mary complied by dying. Now, there are different opinions on the impact of the re-Catholicizing of England. Mary's premature death, like Edward, her death in 1558 left matters up in the air. Just as the Protestant movement had not come to completion when Edward died, neither had the re-Catholicizing project come to fruition when Mary died. So what do we do now? There's two schools of thought on her re-Catholicizing project. One is that it was successful and it was popular. It was thwarted only because she died. A second school of thought says it was botched and effectively a gift to the Protestants. So enter the last chapter of our discussion of English Reformation, and that is the accession to the throne of Mary's sister and Henry's daughter, Elizabeth, seen here as a princess before coronation. Resurgent Protestantism in England benefited, I submit, from the martyrs. Benefited. Their witness infused the church with energy. These men who held their hands in the flames, who went up in a burst of flame and smoke like candles, as they put it themselves, that would light the faith in England and never be put out. And the Marian exiles, these were those who'd fled overseas to the continent. They came back. Seventeen of the 25 bishops in England would be Marian exiles. And that will give you a little bit of a, an idea as to the nature of the church 
after Mary. Now while the Elizabethan settlement, usually dated to the period 1559 to 1562, settled really nothing, Elizabeth's reign did oversee the general, and I would argue permanent, Protestantization of England, said the Spanish ambassador of England. She seems to me incomparably more feared than her sister, and that's saying much, and gives her orders and has her way absolutely as did her father. Now Mary and Elizabeth, they even didn't look alike. Mary was stern in some of the portraits. Elizabeth is this sort of attractive woman, looks rather delicate, but said the Spanish ambassador, she puts fear in people's hearts and she gets what she wants when she wants it. And indeed, it would be hard to argue other in the Elizabethan years. She, Elizabeth, put to death by decapitation Mary, Queen of Scots, and she could be as every bit as ruthless as her sister Mary. It has been said that Elizabeth actually killed more people than Mary did. But that's not what she's remembered. It's Bloody Mary and it's Good King, Good Queen Elizabeth. Several essential points to make uh, during the Elizabethan reign with respect to the Reformation. The Act of Supremacy and Uniformity of 1559. The Third Book of Common Prayer appeared in the same year. The 39 Articles. You can read up on all of these in 1563. There was a strong Erastian theology. That is to say, the monarch again as the supreme head of the church. It starts with Henry, continued by Edward, continued by Mary, continued by Elizabeth. Richard Hooker. His book, The Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, Defending Episcopal Rule, appear at this time. And John Fox, The Acts and Monuments, commonly called the Book of Martyrs, was placed in every church in the realm, first edition, 1563. And the English Geneva Bible appeared in 1560, and this had enduring popularity in England. Well, the Pope was not to be put off by all of this nonsense. He summarily excommunicated Elizabeth. Said, enough of this. I don't care if you are one of my subjects. I excommunicate you. An appeal was made to Zurich and Heinrich Bullinger, Zwingli's successor, published a refutation of the papal excommunication in Latin, German, and English. However, Catholicism could not be wiped out and it could not be altogether absorbed. Even though it was treason to be a Catholic priest in England during these years, many people, especially in Northern England, continued to secretly practice Catholicism. Wealthy families built priest holes in their houses. These were secret hiding places in which priests could be hidden to avoid detection should hostile authorities suddenly appear. Sometimes there were disastrous results to these priest holes. There's one story where the authorities came to a home. Obviously they'd been tipped off. They went straight to the big fireplace where the priest hole was, but they couldn't sort out how to open it. So they lit a fire. Still nobody appeared. So they lit a bigger fire. They finally left in exasperation and disgust. The family who had hidden the priest in there hurriedly put the fire out, opened the priest hole, but it was too late. Their Catholic priest had baked alive. But he didn't come out because that would have been certain death for all involved. Protestant dissenters, however, like the Puritans later and other movements would cause problems, but that's a topic for another occasion. Having succeeded Bloody Mary in 1558, Elizabeth would not come to a premature end. She reigned for 45 years until 1603. She was outwardly, for all intents and purposes, Protestant, and thus England has remained Protestant to the present. Well, the upshot of all of this is that the world of Catholicism was 
slowly, at least visibly, slowly obliterated during the Elizabethan uh, years. By the time she died in 1603, Cranmer's magnificent po uh, prose, codified in the books of common prayer, had replaced the old religion. Week after week after week it was read until it entered the hearts and the minds and the consciousness of English people and possessed them absolutely. And of course the propaganda helped. Here we see some Protestant propaganda depicting Roman priests as wolves. Dates from 1555. Bishop Stephen Gardner is a wolf wearing a mitre. He is slaughtering Christ the Lamb. Edmund Bonner and Cuthbert Tunstall wear sheep's clothing over their Episcopal garments and they literally drink the blood of the sacrificial lamb. This is a lurid parody of the doctrine of transubstantiation. And notice, piled at the feet of these Roman wolves are the carcasses of slaughtered lambs and if you look carefully, each lamb has a name on it. Rogers, Bradford, Cranmer, Latimer, Ridley, Hooper. Well, Fox's Book of Martyrs was myth and propaganda, and year after year of no popery in all matters of religion ultimately yielded up a torrent which swept away the last remnants of a millennium of old religious observance in England. And by the end of the 16th century, the new generation of English Christians didn't know anything other. They had come to believe, literally, that the Pope was the Antichrist. They had become convinced that the Mass was, in fact, a blasphemous humbug. Catholicism came to be viewed by the end of Elizabeth's reign as something foreign, indeed something un-English, something patently characteristic of another world of which we are not part. Well, whatever else figures into this chapter of Christian history, religion was altered dramatically in England. All because this little boy grew up, became the king, and wanted things his own way. So in the end, the Reformation in England did triumph, albeit it did so by violence, rupture, and manipulation. But to quote Hugh Latimer once more, a candle was lit in England upon this rock, and the light of that candle has never been put out.